Hello, everybody. Welcome to day two. How are you feeling after the beer last night? So apparently you had a few. By the sounds of that. Uh, so a few small notices. There are still some slots for lightning talks. So just write your name down on the board outside, uh, above Richie's name, because he's going last. Uh, also, if all speakers, if you could send on our uh, slides, please, so that we can link to them from the schedule. Uh, so now we're going to have Tom, who is going to talk about Cortex, which is uh, long-term storage slash distributed Prometheus. Thank you. Um, does this work? Yes? No? No? Yes. Okay, good. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Brian. Um, as you said, I'm going to talk about Cortex, but first, I'd like everyone to put their hand up. Everyone. No excuses. Right, and now, if you weren't here last year, you can put them down again. If you weren't, yeah. Okay, not as many as I was hoping. So this is going to be a bit of a, a, a weird talk then, because um, it's going to be very referential to last year's talk, and I'm going to try and build on that. Uh, last year, I presented Cortex, which is a, a horizontally scalable, distributed uh, Prometheus um, version of Prometheus, basically. Prometheus-compatible monitoring system, I guess. Um, you should all go and read that or watch that video. So I'll give you about five minutes, yeah? Um, okay, so yeah, about a year ago I had a different haircut. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of what we discussed last year and then I'm just gonna build on it and give you my experience of running this system and, and, and improving this system for the last year. So what is Prometheus? Prometheus is a natively multi-tenant where we, uh, Prometheus service, where we uh, isolate different customers in the same services. Um, we did this because uh, a year ago I worked for a company called WeaveWorks, which is, is sponsoring this event. Um, and we wanted to offer Prometheus as a service as part of uh, our product, which is called WeaveCloud. Um, so we needed multi-tenancy. We wanted to do it in, the, in a single service, not give like a container to each customer, because we wanted it to be nice and easy to operate. We wanted it to be more scalable and so on. We had a bit of experience running a container per customer and it wasn't good. Um, one of the main motivations for Cortex was making it cost effective to run. You know, We've worked as a business, had to make money, and so therefore we had to you know, sell this thing for more than it cost us to run it. And you'll see that later in, uh, in my experience. We also wanted to offer a different set of trade-offs around scalability and HA. Um, Prometheus is a very high-performance system, you know, and it scales vertically very well. Um, but you know, as some people have referenced yesterday, the HA story, if you run a pair of them and one fails, you get gaps in grass and things like that. And that wasn't something that we really wanted to do. We wanted to give more of a kind of traditional HA story, a traditional distributed system story, um, that someone comes to expect from, from a service. Um, one of the nice things about Cortex is we wanted to offer virtually infinite retention and durability. And okay, that's a big promise, but effectively all we've done is, is not make that our responsibility. We've offloaded all of the storage to something like DynamoDB or Google Bigtable, and then, you know, if you want to delete the data from there, great, you lose it, but, but it's not our problem. And this is how you know, with something like DynamoDB, you can actually get really basically infinite retention. Um, and finally, yeah, there was, when you're building a distributed system, there's a bunch of opportunities for performance enhancements that you don't get when you've got a single binary running on a single machine. And, and the best example I've got of this is uh, when you're loading a dashboard through Cortex, um, we parallel, massively parallelize each individual query. Um, sorry, we massively parallel betwi parallelize between different queries. And therefore, like your overall uh, latency to load your dashboard can be better. It can be worse, as well, which we'll cover in a minute. So um, I've got a bit of an example of some diagrams, but I'm going to dive into the bottom one here. Um, this was the architecture we presented at PromCom last year. So we've got a, a normal oh, the laser pointer doesn't work on the screen. That's useful. Um, <laughs> we've got a normal Prometheus up, up in the top left corner. Um, and it's using the remote write API, which I discussed yesterday, to send data to, uh, to Cortex. Um, so Prometheus is still responsible for doing service discovery, still responsible for scraping your jobs, uh, still responsible for doing relabeling, still responsible for doing recording rules at this stage. Um, and in a lot of deployments, still responsible for doing alerts. And then it would take all the data, take all the samples, send them to Cortex, you know, and you run an Nginx that does some authentication or something in front of it, which is not really part of Cortex. And then I've just noticed a typo. And that's going to be in every slide, because I build on this. <laughs> it's 
it's really annoying. And YouTube, bro. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so it sends it to something called the distributor, which definitely should be distributor. Um, and it, this distributor's job is to basically implement the consistent hashing and the Dynamo style replication. So it will, the, the load balancing from the front end to the distributor at the time was just done by the cube proxy, so it was random. Um, but from the distributor down to the ingester, we avoid cube proxy and we target specific ingesters so that we can give some locality to where the time series should live. So the time series get, you know, we pick an ingester to send, or pick three ingesters to send the time series to, we, we replicate them out to the time series, and then it's the ingester's job to build chunks in the same way, Cortex, uh, same way Prometheus builds chunks, and periodically flush these out to S3 uh, with, a, with an inverted memory, uh, an external memory inverted index in DynamoDB and some caching. And then on top of all of this, we picked console as kind of a, a, a place to store the distributed hash ring um, and all the tokens and, and some service discovery data and so on. That's not strictly necessary. One of the things I want to do in the future is make that more optional. So that's uh, in, how long did that take? In five minutes, that's my last year's 40 minute talk. And now we're going to talk about what I've learned in the last year. And I'm going to try and do this roughly chronologically but I'm going to also like focus on problems that, I, that we experienced when we were running it. So the first problem, um, if anyone here works for Amazon, I'm apologizing because I'm probably going to be pretty, pretty uh, detrimental about uh, DynamoDB. We really struggle to saturate our DynamoDB throughput. And for those that aren't familiar with DynamoDB, with DynamoDB, you pay for provision throughput. You don't pay for use, you pay for provision throughput. So we came along and said, you know, we need 10,000 writes a second. We pay for that. And then we find out we get throttled when we try and do 1,000. OK, so ah, oh, crap. You know, and this makes the system, the maths that I did at the beginning, it makes it all invalid and makes it 10 times more expensive to run. DynamoDB was the most expensive uh, operational cost of the system. So why, why was this? You know, um, this was you know, something we scratched our heads about for a while. Dyn uh, Amazon give you some really basic graphs which show you know, 15,000 provision throughput, 1,500 actual throughput. and 10,000, almost 10,000 requests a second being throttled. So it's like, it turns out like this isn't necessarily Amazon's fault. This is more likely the, my use case, my patterns of usage. And so we dug into it, we read a lot. There was a fantastic blog post by um, that company that does the analytics like multiplexing in the States about exactly the same thing. It came out about the same time as I was doing this. And it turns out one of the concepts you've got to understand in DynamoDB is you take a table and it partitions it up into 10 gigabyte chunks. And then it takes you, you take your provision throughput and you divide that by all of your partitions in your table. And so for those who are paying attention, as your table gets bigger, the provision throughput per partition gets smaller. And if you don't have absolutely perfect load balancing, you're going to start, you know, if you're slightly hotspotting one partition, you're going to start getting throttled on that partition, which eventually will just throttle everything. And that, that was the first theory that we had. Um, so we thought, well, what's a quick way of solving that? And what we thought we would do is we would add a job which would periodically rotate the tables, create a new table every week, um, update the code so it knew to read and write from the different tables. Um, and if, you, if you're interested in the analysis and the actual code, it's in this uh, issue here on, on GitHub. Um, but we added this job down here, distributor. Uh, the table manager, we called it, and its job is just to sit there, periodically create tables, periodically do things like scale up the provision throughput on tables and scale down uh, the provision throughput on old tables. And this worked really well. This actually got us through Christmas, uh, basically, um, without the thing you know, exploding. And I was pretty happy. But then in the beginning of the new year, um, we realized it's still not very good. So we had problem number two, which is right throughput again. Um, it turns out, well, I'm going to discuss this first before I go into the details. Uh, we were getting about 30% right throughput, even though we were getting fresh tables every year, uh, every week. We are getting about 30% of the right throughput. And so I really had to go and look at the schema and figure out why my write load was not you know, more uniformly distributed. <laughs> so we've got uh, the schema I went with. For those familiar with DynamoDB, or not familiar, the hash key is the key that you write to DynamoDB that they use to do the distribution between partitions. And the range key is kind of used within a partition to allow you to do range queries, which Cortex is built on the ability to do range queries. So the initial design, we've got a user ID because this is multi-tenant. We've got an hour because we're, we're partitioning the, um, the index by time slices because it, it has some nice uh, properties when you're doing things like having jobs that come and go very quickly. And then we added the metric name. And that was the hash key. And that was all we were distributing the data on. 
And then in the range key, we have the label name, the label value, and the chunk ID. And of course, for every time series, we'd write kind of eight to 10 uh, range keys. Um, but of course, anyone looking at this will realize that, you know, anyone who's run Prometheus will know that for, for some metric names, or I think it was you saying yesterday, Brian, that, you know, uh, 50 to 80% of your, you know, Prometheus usage is really taken up by a handful of metrics. And this is definitely true for this schema. So 50 to 80% of all the write load was going to, you know, one or a small number of partitions. So the solution we came up with was to move the label name into the hash key. And this meant, this actually is still not perfect. Um, it still suffers quite badly, but it's good enough. And it actually gets us to 99% of uh, saturation. So by moving the label name to the hash key, one of the things you'll notice is that you can't now do queries which just involve the metric name. Um, because you need to be able to construct the hash key before you do your query. So we then had to write a second set of hash keys, which look a lot more like this. But in this case, we just emit the label names and label values and just index the chunk IDs. And so this, uh, around this time, we realized you know, the first schema we built is not really going to fly. Uh, in fact, the second schema we built didn't fly either. And neither did the third one. And so by this point, we were like, OK, we need like a schema abstraction layer. So we built a nice interface. We built like this composite schema implementation, which knew for given time ranges to consult this schema and to consult this schema. And since then, since we implemented that, we're now on uh, schema V8, I think, since then. Like, lots of tweaks. You know, one of the things you'll also notice that we discussed last year is that you still need to know the metric name when doing the query. Um, and that's, you know, at the time when I wrote Cortex or when I designed Cortex, I wasn't aware of queries which didn't involve the metric name that were particularly useful. Now I am. Um, so we've also added, or Aaron, who's sitting in the back somewhere, added recently the ability to do queries that don't involve the metric name. So that's a third hash key that gets written just containing the user ID and the day. And then we do some different tricks there to make sure the cardinality of that row is not too large. So, yes, that's about it for that. This gives us, you know, we get 99% of the provision throughput on DynamoDB now. Problem number three, queries of death. Um, Prometheus is not really doesn't really do much to protect itself. You know, if you, if you ask it for, you know, 10 years worth of data, it will happily go away and calculate 10 years worth of data. If you send it a label name with, you know, with a megabyte of binary in it, or maybe a label value with a megabyte, it will consume that. Um, and so this was a problem for us because we're running this as a service and, you know, we did have a few guys try and find the boundaries of this service. <laughs> so uh, at the time, you'll notice in the beginning, um, I didn't, the, I didn't really uh, highlight it, but the read path just went directly through the same binaries as the write path. So the distributor implemented the PromQL query engine. Um, when you did reads, they went to the distributors. They would go and hit the ingesters and go and read from the chunk store, and everyone was happy. Um, but if you managed to find a query of death that would cause a distributor to oom or cause something to you know, crash, then you'd actually take out the write path. And we care a lot about making sure we get your data in and we store it successfully. So what we did is we separated out distributor. That's going to really annoy me. We, uh, we separated out the query path out from the write path. This binary is actually identical to the distributor. Um, we, just, we just run another set of services with some different, slightly different flags. And then at the very top, we just route requests to certain paths to the querier. And this also meant we could scale the two differently because there's very different um, requirements you know, on QPS and latency between our writes, which are very, very predictable. You know, they grow linearly with more customers, but they don't tend to you know, change diurnally or anything like that. And the query, which basically only gets traffic when you know, people are in the office. And one of the other things this will enable in the future is us to kind of elastically scale this uh, in response to demand, but we've not done that yet. So yeah, that was, that was problem number two. Three, I've got my numbering wrong, haven't I? Recording rules and alerts. So this was, as I mentioned earlier, when we first launched Cortex, we just completely ignored recording rules and alerts. And we had them just done in the original Prometheus and send that the actual data, the recording rule data to us. And so um, this was a job, this was a project that Jono, who, who couldn't be here this, uh, this week, but Jono did at Weaveworks, and he added an extra job called the ruler. And this would sit there and periodically uh, do a bunch of queries, read from the, uh, and, and write the results to the ingestion, and basically implement recording rules. We did this, we, one of the decisions we took was to not have the ruler run its queries through the querier. Because again, the usage pattern uh, between the query and the ruler are very different. The ruler is, again, a constant load, something you can scale you know, reasonably well, whereas the query is very unpredictable, something you need to scale up and down on, or do on demand. So yeah, so now it's kind of getting a bit, 
a bit much, right? There's a lot of uh, a lot of things, but it gets simpler the next one. Oh, not not quite the next one, the one after. So problem number four we had. This one was actually my favourite problem um, because it involved some real like real software engineering and, and real debugging. We noticed that uh, everyone loves Grafana graphs. We noticed that the 99th percentile latency on the distributor, spelled correctly this time, is 80 milliseconds, uh, whereas on the ingester is eight. Okay, so if you're familiar with Dynamo style, Dynamo is different to DynamoDB, by the way. Dynamo style consistency is where you write to three replicas, for instance, and then wait for the response from two, and then act the request. So you're just waiting for a response from a quorum of the replicas. So in that kind of situation, you would actually expect the latency profile of the distributor to look very similar to the ingester, if not better. You know, there's a chance where one slow ingester, which would appear here, wouldn't affect the distributor because it would just ignore the slow ingest ingester effectively. So this is kind of the opposite of what I was expecting, and I decided to spend a week or two digging into this. Um, I used all sorts of tools. Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm particularly a big fan of is things like Zipkin and distributed tracing, and that was actually the tool that really showed me there were these big pauses in the distributor where it would parse a request, it would do a bunch of stuff, and then I couldn't quite figure out what it was doing. And it turned out it was garbage collection, because Go is really good at garbage collection. Um, the thing that eventually I realized after look, finally looking into the, uh, the generated protobuf code is that protobuffers in Go, or the default protobuffer compiler, actually relies on reflection. Like it generates some structs, but the actual marshalling to and from those structs is reflection based. So the minute I moved away from that and to, to something called GoGo Proto, which is a, a proto buff compiler that actually generates real code and allows you to do things like not have as many pointers, not have as many uh, pointers, and, and add your own types in there to do things like zero copy, um, we managed to get the latency from 80 to 100 milliseconds down to 25. And this looks a lot more like the latency profile. I didn't quite believe, you know, this is getting quite late at night, I didn't quite believe that I'd managed to reduce it by like 4x. So I rolled back the change, and I was like, oh, crap. It really did, it really did reduce it by 4x. So then I rolled it, you know, rolled it forward again and, and wrote a nice blog post, which you should check out. So finally, problem number five, cost. Um, I alluded to this at the beginning. The system cost us a lot more to run than we expected. Um, the maths was slightly off. Um, but also, just generally, I hadn't considered certain possibilities. And one of the things you'll notice at the very beginning, we were putting the chunks in S3 and we were indexing them in DynamoDB. And S3 and DynamoDB have very different cost structures. Um, I didn't really understand this at the time, but once you kind of normalize them so you're looking at the same units, you end up with a table that kind of looks like this, which fits very pleasingly with these monitors. Um, DynamoDB is an order of magnitude cheaper to do IOPS to, to do operations on, but an order of magnitude more expensive to store data in. And this can't be coincidence, like surely Amazon have done this on purpose. And if you plot this on a graph, so you've got the size of the object you're storing and the cost of storing it. You'll notice for small objects, it's cheaper to store it in DynamoDB, and for large objects, it's more expensive. You know, it's cheaper to put it in S3. And our objects were chunks. They were one kilobyte in size. They're like down here. And so, of course, it makes a lot more sense to put them in DynamoDB. So we got rid of S3. We actually finally managed to delete a moving part, um, put it all in DynamoDB, and we reduced the cost of running this thing by over 50% which is a pretty good day's work. Finally, last problem, DynamoDB, again. <laughs> I was getting kind of fed up at this point. Um, at the same time, I decided to leave Weaveworks and, and go it on my own, and I decided to reevaluate whether I wanted to use DynamoDB. And, and if you go and talk to the Weaveworks guys, I'm sure they'll tell you a lot more stories about their woes with DynamoDB. But what I decided to do was move to Bigtable, so Google's, Google Cloud's version of DynamoDB, effectively. Um, we did this, it, it turned out it was super easy. There was already an abstraction layer inside Cortex that you just had to implement, and it took us a few days to implement and get it working and debug. And we ended up with some really nice results. Firstly, the, num the amount of code you need to write to, to Bigtable, about 400 lines of code versus the 2,000 that it took to write to DynamoDB. And that, that seems a bit strange, but if you go into the DynamoDB code, you'll see that there's like exponential back off and there's all sorts of retry logic and there's extra monitoring because we had so much problems saturating the, the bandwidth and there's, you know, it's just a really hard API to work against. Bigtable, on the other hand, gRPC API, it's all auto-generated, just works really well. I don't work for Google, by the way. Like, I just actually like Bigtable. Um, write performance is very similar, slightly wider spread. 
Um, but read performance was the other nice thing, like the read performance of Bigtable was significantly better. And this is probably because my Bigtable is over-provisioned, but also like the provisioning model between Bigtable and DynamoDB is completely different. In DynamoDB, I had to statically assign you know, how much read and write throughput I wanted. Bigtable, I pick how many instances I want, you know, and, and, and it just shares the available CPU and memory through all of that. And with all of this, it's less than a third of the price as well. So, you know, Google should pay me for this. <laughs> um, so closing thoughts. Uh, DynamoDB write throughput was like, I literally spent two or three months of my life getting to the stage where I could saturate DynamoDB, um, which is two or three months I'm never going to get back. Uh, the recording rules and alerts was really cool when we added it. Uh, the long tail, that's actually, I would really encourage you to go and read the blog post because using all sorts of tools, it shows you how to use them, and that was something I was really proud of. And the cost work is something I probably should have done in the design. Um, and since then, you know, I've decided to add cost sections to all of my design documents. And DynamoDB and Bigtable was an interesting discovery. So some extra data. We've been running this thing for over 12 months now. Uh, if we look at the availability, we're not, we're, we're you know, 99.8, 99.9% available um, for, for reads. Uh, the main problems we've had here have been uh, the outage that S3 had, where you couldn't read or write from S3. And so we had a hard dependency on S3 where we actually kind of didn't need to and we could have could have returned partially degraded results. And that's really the only, the only problem we had there. Durability, we've lost a lot less than two days of data, um, but it's hard to put a bound on it. Um, especially as uh, we've had about three incidents where we've potentially lost data, and the amount of data kept in the ingesters is about 12 hours, maybe a little bit more. And because we've lost bits here and bits there, it's hard for us to know exactly what data we've lost. So this is the pessimistic estimate, is we're about 99.5% durable over the last year. Performance, this is against Bigtable, uh, sorry, against DynamoDB. We've found that performance uh, for writes is exceptional because it's just in memory. Um, performance for reads is two to 300 milliseconds. That's a bit optimistic, that number. Maybe that one's against big table. I have found the big table read performance to be significantly better. The big problem with the read performance is it's highly variable. You know, if you do a query that involves a lot of time series, it's slower than Prometheus. If you do queries, you know, lots of uh, queries in parallel that, uh, that involve fewer number of time series, then it, it's faster than a single Prometheus because it's got more resources. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm pretty happy with the performance. It's nice and interactive and it works quite well. So, where are we going with Cortex in the future? Now that I'm working on Cortex full time, a bit of a change of direction from, from uh, what I was doing at Weaveworks. One of the things I want to do is integrate it more closely with Prometheus. I've been talking a lot with um, Fabian, who I can't see, but, and, uh, where is he? And the chap at the back whose name escapes me, I'm really sorry. Um, talking a lot about doing direct chunk writes from Prometheus straight into the chunk store, so avoiding the whole ingester. This will make it a lot cheaper to run and, and will give people the kind of long-term storage that they, they, they seem to want a bit more. Um, we want to do a sep we want to separate out the ingester index. So currently the, the, the ingesters have an in-memory index um, that helps them answer queries against the last kind of 12 hours of data. We want to move that out into a separate service and this will allow us to do a different kind of load balancing and distribution on that index as we do on the time series. And so it will generally allow us to do better load balancing. Um, I definitely want to use Prometheus TSDB for the ingesters. I've got a kind of, you know, uh, Prometheus 1-esque system that I've kind of hacked up and forked from there, and I want to move it forward to the new thing. I've already discussed uh, moving to Gossip for the ring storage and, and maybe adding etcd, maybe looking at uh, libkv and stuff like that for an abstraction layer there. And I did the same calculations that I did for S3 and DynamoDB for uh, Google Cloud Storage, which is their S3 competitor and Bigtable, and it turns out the answer is the opposite. It turns out it's actually cheaper to put the chunks in cloud storage this time. Um, so that's something I want to do. I want to make the system. Also, cloud storage has incredibly good latency. I don't know how they do it, but the, the S3 latency for small objects is atrocious. Like, you know, 99th percentile is like a second. Uh, cloud storage doesn't have that. It's much, much faster. So really quickly, one more thing. As I've alluded to, I've left Weaveworks at, oh, I've left Weaveworks at the beginning of June to focus on Prometheus and Cortex development. Since then, I've teamed up with a chap called David, who's in the corner over there. Um, and we're working together on some ideas around Prometheus and logging and tracing. As I'm now, like, you know, we're self-employed and we're looking for work, this is a teeny, lot, teeny little pitch. You know, if anyone wants some Prometheus hosting or consulting or training or support or anything, um, you know, just give us a ping. We've registered a, a little website and stuff. You should check it out. 
I just want to give you a quick idea of some of our ideas here. Most of this is complete demo work. Um, this works. This is our new UI for Cortex. Um, so you can do tab completion and all the usual things. Um, and the graphics are awfully low resolution. I apologize. Uh, but that works really well. But one of the things we've, we've, one of the ideas we've got that we've working on that we've prototyped is the ability to use the Cortex index. I talked about separating out the ingester index and the chunk store index. Use that to also index log data. So we've got a, a mode where you can switch to looking at log data and it preserves the uh, selector you've used because it's just using the same indexing mechanism and gives you a stream of log entries instead. And this allows you to chop and change between metrics and logs really quickly. Or at least that's our idea. Um, and we want to do the same thing, and this is really verging into the world of demoware now. We want to do the same thing with tracing. Uh, I've got a project that I was working on a while ago called Loki, um, which does kind of Prometheus-style <coughs> tool-based tracing, and I want to integrate that into here as well. Yeah, it's basically Zipkin, yeah. It's the same idea, at least. Different codes, written in Go, uses Protobuf. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Tom. Questions? Five minutes. Hi, so I have uh, two questions. First of all, um, is any of that open source? All of Cortex is open source. All right, cool. All of Loki, the tracing stuff, is open source. The logging stuff is too embarrassing to open source, but will be open source. <laughs> <laughs> and second question, um, maybe I misunderstand, but uh, if you do big queries, like big requests, yeah. uh, at some point, you'll have to uh, get all uh, all data back to one Prometheus instance. So, are you is that true? And are you so limited by uh, the memory you have on uh, the Prometheus that yeah. uh, from from which the request were was issued? Or so right now, the uh, the query the query service in here isn't actually a Prometheus; it's a customized service. Right, uh, it uses a Prometheus query engine. So right now, yes, it's true. But one of the things I want to do in the future, and one of the potential query optimizations, is slicing up and parallelizing big queries in the time dimension. And would you also handle um, aggregation? I mean, uh... yeah, well, I'm, I'm hoping. I mean, there's a lot of detail and and a lot of trickiness and a lot of overlaps and so on. But I'm hoping, for instance, if you do a month query, I can dissect it into day queries and then just mm. do all the days in parallel and respond quicker and not be limited. But right now, you are limited, right? Okay, thanks. It turns out not to be a massive practical problem. But, but yeah, I want to do, I want to do optimizations. This is one of the things you can do in a distributed system that's harder to do in Prometheus. Okay. Uh, what, next question. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, uh, do you have any plans to, to port, uh, the storage engine to not depend on, uh, cloud-based storage engines, but something you can self-host? Are you, uh, are you a, a plant? So I was literally talking to somebody about this yesterday. There's an abstraction layer. Um, and I've kind of half hacked up a version that works on Cassandra already. Um, I'm looking at, I don't know, other ones, suggestions. Um, I'm working with another company that has their own closed source one that they want to have a storage engine for. Uh, so yep. there's a nice abstraction layer. Yeah, um, so like uh, my, my, my favorite example is CockroachDB because it's also a nice Go-based database and yeah. can do indexing and storage. Um, Cortex has, a, has like very loose requirements on its storage cool. it, as long as you can like do range queries and get data from it. So CockroachDB is like massive overkill for what we need. Yep. Um, but yeah, sure. Like if there's an abstraction layer, it's really easy to uh, to add as as we just demonstrated. 400 lines of code talks to big tables. So nice. Okay. So yeah. Uh, Sneha, if you get ready, please. Uh, this Cortex. How how much is this Prometheus still? Uh, it's a good question. Um, it uses a lot of Prometheus. It uses uh, the query engine completely unmodified and the chunk storage completely unmodified. And more recently, a lot of the APIs internally within Cortex have been ported up to Prometheus. So the remote APIs, the remote write and the remote read APIs use exactly the same proto buffers. Um, the API is completely the same, uses the same API code. Uh, other than that, it's all custom. Um, so it, it, you know, there's a lot of custom code there. Um, I mean, if you look in the Cortex repo, it's all custom code because we just vendor in Prometheus. And I, I didn't—I should have a line of code count, but it's you know it's probably like twenty thousand lines of code. So it's a lot. Thank you. Any more questions? Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.